Good morning and welcome to today's Crossroads, Women in Supply Chain and IT. In today's episode, we feature a very special guest, Anupurna Vishwanathan. Anupurna is the CIO of Cummins India, a Fortune 500 company. She has over 15 years of experience across companies like Coca-Cola, GE and ATOS Origin. Over the years, she has been responsible for defining and delivering digital strategy across various functions like manufacturing, logistics, uh, commercials and sales. She's also been exposed to various technology domains like uh, product development, ERP integration, m and and IT infrastructure. So thank you so much for joining us today, Anapurna. I'm super excited about this interview. Um, you started your career at GE where you worked across various product domains and across various industry verticals. What are the key leadership inputs that you have gained from attending various leadership programs and how have you evolved as a global leader? Hi, Shreya, and thank you for having me here. Um, I think um, the first five years of my career were entirely leadership programs. So the first two years was, you know, on a program called as IMLP, which was you know, six month rotation across businesses, across various aspects of technology. And then the next three years were on a program called as corporate audit staff. And, uh, you know, the idea there was that your day job is an auditor and uh, you audit, you know, across the company, across regions, um, critical risks that are important to the company. And when I look back today, right, um, I think those five years for me were one of the most fundamental uh, in terms of, you know, how it shaped me for a corporate career, forget about leadership, but even very simple corporate career, right? And if I were to really summarize three things that I've taken away from, from those five years, I think the first thing is, you know, the ability to go deep fast, you know, we were, we were constantly rotating. So, it would either be a six-month stint or it would be a four-month stint, but in those six or four months, we basically had to go in, identify, understand the business. We had to, you know, um, get to know what is the problem, identify the problem. Then you have to think about a solution and your rating or, you know, your performance was evaluated not on your ability to identify the problem, but to actually solve it because you're an internal function, right? And so in those extremely short timelines, because you were rotating and because you were, you had to get it done and you didn't have, you know, any kind of extension whatsoever, right? Like it gave me the ability to zero in on the problem faster. And again, that is something that literally on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it is thinking about a project, whether it is thinking about a strategy, right? Everything I do, that, that skill set that has you know, come over time and, you know, being honed because of those programs is, is, you know, very, very influential to my career. The second thing is that, you know, the expanse, right, the vastness with which we would be rotated, like, you know, in January, I might be uh, in, in treasury trying to audit some derivative system. And in uh, uh, October, I might be in oil and gas trying to manage an integration, you know, the vastness, it was just amazing, right? Um, January might be North America and uh, October might be Europe. And so the fact is that every time you are thrown into a completely new area, sometimes a different region, sometimes uh, a different business context. And at that point, GE was a conglomerate of 10 odd companies. And if you have 10 companies, right, like power, aviation, NBC Universal, like very, very different, very day and night kind of companies, you have to understand the business context, right? Now, the Excuse. fact is that when when you do those kind of rotations, the one thing it really, really does to you is that it takes away the fear of unknown, right? You are not scared of going into any region, any business, any technology, any problem. Because if you've done that for five years, you've just rotated and you rotate about, about 12, 13 times, right? It becomes a habit. You know, you're extremely comfortable with ambiguity. It doesn't bog you down. So when I look back, it's given me the ability to never say no to a challenging role because I've not been scared of it. You know, that fear has been beaten out of me in those five years, right? And so I think that I didn't realize it then, but I think that's been a, a very, very big, um, you know, trait that those five years have, have given me, right? And, you know, also very simple stuff, operational rigor, right? I mean, uh, corporate audit staff, 
used to be a little bit um, you know extremely regimented and when today me and my friends from who are alumni of the program we sit together right we are still grateful for some of those you know regimentation that it taught us very very simple things right your monday morning will start off you know from with an email from your manager ask, saying that these are the goals you're going to accomplish you know over the week of uh, over the period of this week um your wednesdays would be you know going to your clients because it was more like an internal consulting and talking to them about these are the issues i found thursday would be the senior clients friday you would wind down and summarize what you've accomplished right every two weeks you will have development discussions which has nothing to do with work but just focused on how you were showing up your development and you know the feedback was constant and was intense right so the managers were learning how to give feedback how to identify areas of growth for you know individual for the associates and associates were learning to take that feedback make themselves you know better on a day to day basis so some of this you to the best extent possible i try to do it even today because just that regimentation and that operating rhythm helps achieve a lot of goals that you know otherwise you miss out on and i think you know to your question on on the global aspect of this right at any point these programs had like 30 to 40 different countries represented and so when you start the journey right there is obviously that initial repetition that you know this person is from this region i've never been here i don't know what the deal is right but um, as you get to know them as you you become friends because you're living together you're working for 20 hour days together as you get to know them you realize that people are the same at the core you know they are exactly the same and so those uh, overlays of cultural context and things that tend to cause inhibitions right they they melt away in as many years and so even today right i i, I think that love for meeting people from around the world just getting to know them for who they are and not being bogged down by those cultural contexts right i think you know are things i hold very dear and it's not just uh, shaped how i show up in a corporate career right but it's also shaped just who i am as a person so very grateful for those couple of crazy years my god it's uh, what a what a, to be so fortunate to have this uh, amazing experience and rigor that has that has you know made you and shaped you to who you are but i think uh, overall uh, yeah, across the globe uh, i don't think very many companies go are able to uh, you know put le- put their leadership through the kind of rigor that you had you have gone through what do you think is the leadership crisis that we're you know facing across organizations uh and and what is the change that we need to bring maybe a few points on on how we can make the next generation future ready for for the you know problems that are to come very honestly like you know when i think about it the world is changing right i mean the functional competencies are changing priorities are changing technologies are changing you know everything around us is constantly changing there's literally hardly even one thing that is not changing but when you look at what leadership is fundamentally it is just simplistically leading people and when you look at people and their needs and what they want and what they aspire for and what gives them happiness you know somewhere it's not changing at the same pace that everything around us is changing right it's 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 much more simpler so personally and again it's a very personal opinion right that i feel that the biggest leadership crisis today is in cultivating a group of genuine authentic emotionally aware but capable leaders to be able to lead people through all of these changes now if we are to do that right it really depends on the tonality at our workplaces right we we need to learn to build organizations where people are genuinely able to bring you know their whole selves to work they're not judged for who they are but the difficulty is you know in that balance between being empathetic and driving accountability you can't really have one at the cost of the other but driving that balance honestly is not a science it's an art right and it's a leadership art and the way companies you know need to start making it a part of their culture i think is the biggest challenge that we face from a leadership development standpoint now i've been with comments for about 2 years coming up to 2 years now and the one thing that i've genuinely enjoyed is the focus on developing this muscle across the organization so you know i've been i've worked in 
multiple companies in the past and i genuinely haven't seen this in the you know in in any of my previous experiences nor have i heard of it uh, you know from friends in other organizations i'll give you a couple of very very simple example there was a email that said that it's okay to not be okay it was a very simple email it went out for the entire company right but honestly it meant so much to the person who was not okay that day you know that person felt comfortable coming into the organization not feeling like they need to duck and hide or put on a mask or put on a brave face you know you people were just let let to be themselves the second example and this came very early when i had joined cummins and that's why it, it leaves a very strong mark on me is that there was this mailer that came from a global woman leader who who spoke in a blog format about her mental health challenges and you know instantly right like people oh. were okay being anxious they were okay being you know worried and it was okay to be themselves right and uh, the fact you know these two instances give a very simple view that you don't need to duck you don't need to hide you can genuinely be yourself and i personally have seen that you know an environment that lets you genuinely be yourself tends to bring out the best in you and so when i think of you know a leadership conundrum or a, or a challenge i think for me it is seeing organizations recognize this and then trying to you know create that culture globally across all employees consistently it's it's a significant achievement if you're able to do it right because you honestly bring build a much better workplace right but, but can you double down a little bit about the duality of of this leaders are supposed to you know be the uh, defining the path going forward and and at the same time contrast that with vulnerability um how do you how do you do that and i and i and i guess it would be easier if you weren't a leader so to say to to be to be open about some of these things but as you move up it becomes harder can you talk to me a little bit about if you have faced it can you any anecdotes absolutely absolutely so um you know vulnerability is theoretically a very uncomfortable context right me just letting down my guard i'm supposed to be a certain way but just letting down my guard we have a training and comments called as building success in yourself okay and when we go into uh, the training um there are multiple extremely senior leaders who come in and who talk about their most vulnerable moments you know and honestly uh, and there are large training batches right there are um, you know 100 plus people in some of these sessions and you won't believe it shreya the the resonance is 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 100% the same the minute the leader talks about their most vulnerable points in their life how it made them feel how they came from there to be where they are right and the positions and and these are extremely tough circumstances and situations instantly and this is held over zoom instantly the 100 people suddenly start identifying with this leader as their own you know the connect is instantaneous they can't stop talking about the stories that are shared you know and um, that's a very very powerful way of connecting and you know and very honestly even personally when i have been able to be my vulnerable self i found two things happen one is i myself i'm unburdened you know i am unburdened by the baggages i'm carrying and it it makes me again show up in a better way and in a wholesome way and second it goes back to the philosophy of it's okay to not be okay you know everybody has their journey and so it empowers people who are looking at me to be okay to not be okay right and so it's a it's a it feels difficult it feels contradictory to how leaders have historically been perceived but honestly i think the power of that tool i've seen it in action over the last year year and a half and you know i'm i'm blown away by what you you know you can accomplish as a leader by being authentic by being vulnerable you know by being empathetic it's because you're people at the end of the day there are goals there are performances there are objectives but you're still people right so good to hear this i guess anecdotally especially from coming from you uh you've also i've heard that you've also learned uh 
led multiple women's network and you're sort of passionate about uh, mentoring young talent. What do you think about the diversity, women in particular, in the workspace? Is it, are we there yet? Do we have some time to go? I think, um, you know, it's a, it, it, so I didn't feel anything about being a woman in tech or anything like that, right? Till the day I had a child, you know, I've never found myself to be different from my husband or my brothers or any of the men in my life. And I've always competed wildly, you know, with all of them. But the, but the day your child is born, something changes, you know, your responsibilities change and some things change, right? But the fact is that, you know, one thing, and, and that's when honestly, for me personally, the resonance with, you know, diversity or the resonance with that leaky pipeline, as it's called, right? You're early in your career, you have more women. And as you grow senior, you know, slowly those numbers come down, right? The resonance with that problem, that's when it happened for me. Because up until then, I was running through all of these crazy leadership programs. I've never once felt, you know, any different from any man on on those programs. But the day my child was born, two things happened. My sense of responsibility is also moved. And second is the way the world was perceiving me and my ability to give my best also shifted. And uh, whether it was fair or not is, again, a question of bias and things like that. But when I think about technology, right, technology is one of those few areas that definitely offers a level level playing field. You can be anywhere and you can work, right? But that said, right, that leaky pipeline is still a crazy problem. You know, the world is definitely, definitely moving to, you know, a much more equitable way. Like, I think there was a statistic I was reading Um, in 2020, 44% of the total tech offers that went out were actually to women. You know, we are inching towards that equality. But the fact is that when you look at, you know, leadership positions, when you look at boardrooms, there is still a lot. There is still a, you know, long way to go. A few things that I'm extremely proud of, right, is that. Um, Cummins is led by a woman CEO globally and um, some of our largest businesses globally are led by women. In India, the leadership team is 44% women. Um, You know, we have functions, including the tech function that are more than 40% women. So again, it's a matter of, you know, there's, there's a statistic actually which talks about that if you have women you know, at senior levels, right, in the C-suite or in the boardrooms and, and at senior levels, what happens is that there, there's this percolatory effect, you know, below. So about 7 to 10% increase is seen in women across all levels. And so, you know, the fact that we are moving towards that, for me, is a source of great joy. But at the same time, we are not there yet. It's very easy to slip from all the work that's built, right? A simple example, the pandemic came, women were not able to take the kind of workload and they ended up resigning. And, you know, there is so much narrative and leadership discussion on the fact that those two years have set us, you know, back by generations, a generation and a half. And so, you know, it's it's a very, very slippery slope. But the fact that organizations and society in general is willing to climb that mountain Albeit there might be some of those kidding downwards that happen is heartening. But I think that focus needs to be on else. It's very easy to, you know, flip right back. Is there something that that you do consciously or that we can do uh, to fill this gap while while we're trying to get close, closer, closer to it? Yes, right. It is a matter of prioritization, right? On a day-to-day basis, when you think about it, Shreya, Right. You have rules. You're trying to fill those rules. Right. There are business pressures. You need to fill rules quickly. Right. But it it's harder to find, you know, the right candidate. Right. And uh, very simple things exist. Like when if 10 people are to be interviewed, seven or eight will be men and two will be women. And so clearly the chances of hiring a man is higher. Right. And so if each one of us pushes ourselves you know, um, to in this is not about equality. This is about equity. And the difference is a very subtle one, but it's a very important one, right? Equality will say that, you know, I, I interview five men and five women. Equity will say that I'm trying to fix generations of women not having that opportunity. So I'm going to interview six or seven women 
to those three men because i'm trying to fix i'm trying to get women on an equal footing and so on a day to day basis if we recognize the differentiation between that equity and equality and hold ourselves to a higher standard right it's it's an easy gap to fill but there are 100 pressures that we work through on a daily basis right it's not just the diversity discourse right there's there's business results there are roles to be filled so it's easy to slip but i think if each of us holds ourselves to that state it's it's going to be a much more equitable world um i also hear that you're a strong lgbtq ally um i would love to hear your experience on how comments is ensuring that uh, a safe and in- inclusive workspace for the lgbt community it again boils down to inclusion right um the fact is that you know <coughs> we we all belong to this world and this world belongs to you know each of us irrespective of our gender irrespective of our sexual orientation irrespective of any of those regional you know nuances can be a dime a dozen right but the fact that um, you know it's it's everybody's world is is very central to you know at least my belief with respect to you know an inclusion and lgbtq and all of that right i think as i was interviewing for my role here um you know standard things right you google you try to you know find out what is the company known for uh, and i saw that um, you know cummins was very very active uh, you know with the pride network with pride marches um, you know a, a lot of work was very vocally done and mind this mind you this was around the time of you know 377 debate and all of that right and you know not once did we take a back step or hesitate right we were vocally inclusive and you know for me that was something of a, a, a an influencer or a you know the fact that inclusion means something to this organization right and today when i look at it right we have um lgbtq plus friendly policies we have you know infrastructure that is lgbtq plus friendly right um, you know the the medical policies are gender neutral whether it is gender reassignment surgery there is you know there are policies for that there is support for that there's a very strong employee resource group called as the pride erg right where it is okay for everybody to show up and to genuinely be allies of the community and to encourage inclusion across the company right and to bring that narrative because honestly speaking that narrative is not comfortable for everybody right if you if you take a sample of people on the street not everybody is going to be comfortable with that narrative and so having these conversations being vocal about it you know showing your representation in external events mentoring you know young people from the community who are trying to find their feet and who don't know how to do it these are important initiatives and we are honestly invested and i'm thrilled about it um, just last week we actually incidentally also were recognized as a gold employer in the india workplace equality index and so it you know it's a it's, it's a nice pat on the back for you know the the philosophy that's governed our uh, approach to pride and inclusion but you know it's still a long way to go we're not there there's still a long way to go but we're headed in the right direction that's uh, so heartwarming to hear this anyway, so i'd like to pivot a little bit and deep dive on how comins is thinking about digital transformation in supply chain um supply chain has now become or becoming a boardroom conversation and manufacturers are looking to fast track supply chain transformation and you know are prepared for all seasons at all time what are your aspirations for a future ready uh, supply chain at comin and are there any investments that you are making in terms of money mind share and anything else included to be able to get to your aspirations absolutely and so um so from a comin's perspective right we think about supply chain as an integrated supply chain we don't we no longer call the function also as supply chain right the the key word is that integration right um the past couple of years have have really really shown us the need for supply chain resiliency for some you know for being able to manage some of those challenges some blind spots right so if i look at comin's supply chain area right now right our focus is on a couple of things the first is to make ourselves more agile and flexible right the second is we have a very very vast presence so how do we really leverage this global and regional presence so that we are able to source and move material from the right place at the right time at the right speed right the third is that again thanks to all of this that's happening in the supply chain world right there's a lot of trade policy changes also 
And so you need resilience to be able to combat some of those trade policy changes as well. Now, if you have to bring all of this together, right, fundamentally somewhere a part of the solution is technology, right? And so, you know, even at Cummins, we realize the, the need for having, you know, that supply chain spinal cord, right, that genuinely integrates all aspects of our ap- operations, be it manufacturing, be it logistics, you know, uh, be it warehousing, be it, you know, just a capability planning, supplier capability planning, right? So we've got to start integrating all of this. And it's like, a, you know, it's like that there's this uh, small little game of pipes, right? If you don't plug the pipes together at the point that the water flow starts, you know, you'll have some sort of leakage. It's very simple logic. But when you have to do that with a world worth of systems, people, processes, you know, and nuances, it's a very, very complex problem, right? But I think, you know, when you talk about, um, you know, what is the investment, right? In terms of mindshare, I think we are already there. The problem was recognized two years ago when, you know, the world was clamoring for parts and, you know, there was nothing you could do. How do you sell if you don't get the parts? And so, you know, from a leadership standpoint, the mindshare and the resources, be it people or money, it's absolutely there. I think realistically, what across the world, you know, people need to do is to make sure that there is the right supply chain as well as technology leadership, you know, and at, at a more execution, at a more fundamental execution level, there are people who understand the problem and therefore when they bring tech or when they try to do a digital transformation, they're able to really, you know, enable the outcomes for which the journey was started in the first place. So how do we translate that vision and that understanding of that challenge across the organization so that we, you know, genuinely solve the problem? I think that's the tricky part of the, you know, supply chain digital transformation. But it's a very, very necessary one, to be honest. Yeah, no, definitely. I've, I've, I've heard this so many times across, you know, my conversation is technology is only going to you know, amplify the existing process. So I think someone coming in with the expertise of understanding the process is definitely better able to amplify what technology can could possibly do. Is there any innovation that you are excited about in the supply chain space that stands out of the crowd? So mm, my response to it is a little tangential, to be honest, here. Yeah. Right. Um, we spoke about it, that supply chain is under flux. You know, there's so many things for which you need to change. Now, innovators and technologists, right, they're a very smart lot. And so when you look at the, you know, at the slew of solutions that's actually available, right, be it IIoT, be it real-time insights, advanced analytics, optimization algorithms, visibility, connectivity, connectivity sustainability, you name it. And you have solutions available, right? Now, the fact is that the way I see it is that these are like blocks, right? You can put any two blocks together to get some amazing solutions in terms of innovation, right? So you combine uh, IIoT, you get visibility of machines, right? You add it with real-time insights, right? You're able to see what is happening to your machine in a real time and therefore make decisions, right? You combine analytics and sustainability and you have the ability to actually have actionable intelligence on goals like, you know, zero carbon or sustainability or any of those goals. So for me, especially as someone from the technology space, right, I am not as enamored by technology innovations because, you know, the world is full of extremely capable you know, technologists who will find a solution, any problem you throw at them within a couple of months, a solution will be ready, right? But the challenge to this in our current ecosystem is execution. So you may have all of the solutions in the world, but if you are not able to execute and implement them effectively, right, it's all theoretical. So in theory, right, when you put, uh, when you pick a solution set, and you go across the organization, implementing that consistently in every factory, every plant, you know, uh, for every supplier, across your landscape, right? Over time, your ab- ability to build data visibility in your process, it's just tremendous. But if one rogue plant out there decides to go off, pick another solution, suddenly that becomes a blind spot. So it's not rocket science to, to bring in the right technology. But it is extreme discipline to make sure that you stick to the, the, the thought and the strategy that you had in the first place 
and you peck at it and you execute it and you execute it in a manner that you know like i said before that you are delivering to the business outcomes that you signed up for in the first place right and if you were to do that right honestly that's when we're talking about you know an extremely strong digitized supply chain capability and honestly companies who have built that right you can see their differentiation literally in the market and and so for me i think that's that's the focus area it's not the newness but stick to the ground and execute right that's where my heads are so, so you spoke about sustainability uh, a little bit uh, you know while you were talking about uh, you know technology innovations and it's seeming to become a priority decarbonization is is the talk of the town and everyone's you know trying to move towards it several companies are also trying to fight against climate change while defining it strategy with focus business outcomes what are the considerations that you have to keep in mind while balancing new demands such as sustainability and climate change for a company like ours especially right like technology has the scale is large right you have an international scale as well as you know local realities right and so i think that whole belief that we have as a one commons organization where we think about the right solution that will fit globally is a very very powerful one right and it's about again coming back to execution it's about executing it right so that you genuinely have that central control target but i think that balance is a very delicate and a nuanced balance right so while there are you know while there are solutions defined globally right giving local teams that autonomy and that flexibility to actually operate at a local and regional level right be it a, you know for managing water risks or driving visibility to you know any kind of sustainable go- uh, goal that we've taken up locally right giving us a flexibility is important and i think that it's a, it's a delicate balance now at commons right you've probably read about our destination zero you you know read about our commitment to the environment and so across the company across countries right the leadership commitment to sustainability and actually driving towards a, a world which barely 30 years from now you know is is net zero uh, carbon is you know it's an audacious goal and if we were to take on that audacious goal right um there is a lot of thought with respect to even simple things like you know your environment management systems your building management systems your your iiot and your you know emission monitoring systems uh, even our products right with the whole um, you know the emissions technology business line right is dedicated to you know being able to build that better world so be it an engineering side of product or be it an it and technology side of product right the commitment to hit that overall company ambition of destination zero is a very very strong one right so i think there's a lot being done and we need to stay the course it's it's a long journey and so it's you know and it's a lot of handoffs that will happen in terms of people and so it's important that it it becomes the marching beat of the organization and that's what we're working towards that how do we genuinely make it you know a marching beat of the organization so we deliver to that goal it's it's uh, i don't have any more questions this has been wonderful indeed uh, i just focus on execution and and drive towards destination zero it's uh, it's been truly insightful i I thoroughly enjoyed this. I'm sure the viewers have also thoroughly enjoyed this. Uh, thank you again for taking the time out and and chatting with me. Thank you so much, Shreya. And thanks again to our Crossroads community to watching this episode of Women in Supply Chain and IT. Follow us to learn more from the industry leaders. Mm-hmm.